Okay, hi everyone. I think we can kick off now. Um, I'm Jackie Smith. I'm a professor of respiratory medicine uh, at the university, um, based mainly over at, at uh, Withenshaw Hospital. And I'm the director of the Manchester Clinical Research Facility. Just share my slides. And what we're planning to do today is to give you a bit of an overview of our facility, which I'm going to do, how it works, what sort of studies we do. And then two of my colleagues who are the directors of the clinical research facilities at Withenshaw Christie are going, to, are going to give you some examples of the kind of studies that the CRFs have supported at, at their sites. And then we should have about 15 minutes left for questions at the end. So, so what is the Manchester Clinical Research Facility? Well, it is a grant funded by the National Institute for Health and Social Care Research. And our vision is to speed up the translation of scientific advances and provide research participation as an option for patients of all ages and backgrounds across Greater Manchester. Our remit is very much to do that in the context of early phase clinical trials, which typically we, we'd consider up to phase 2A, and also clinical experimental medicine research studies in both adults and children. So these can be the development of medicines, of devices, of diagnostic tests. And I put approximately to phase 2A there because we also support later phase trials when they have a level of complexity that requires the input of our staff and our facilities. We provide safe and quality assured facilities and our staff have a lot of experience in ex and uh, mm -hmm. expertise in the delivery of complex and high intensity studies. So what do we mean by clinical experimental medicine? So NIHR have a definition of this and different organisations have different definitions. But for us in NIHR, the key is that these are investigations in humans and that are seeking to either characterise the cause of human disease or to identify or evaluate novel approaches to diagnosis and to treatment. In terms of the innovation pathway, that this puts us at the early in invention and evaluation stage. As I say, in terms of drug development, what we typically think of as phase one and two, whereas phase three and four later phase trials are more about adoption and diffusion. And we're part of a number of different bits of NIHR funded research infrastructure um, across Manchester. So in addition to the um, CRF, you've probably heard of the Biomedical Research Centre and we work very closely with the Manchester BRC. We share staff and we share um, functions across things like patient and public involvement, um, industry work, uh, training um, and also comms. In addition, um, particularly over at the Christie, we have the Experimental Cancer Medicine Centre, which is also NIHR funded and focuses on early phase work in cancer. And then we also have the Translational Research Collaborations, which focus on particular disease areas and uh, connect experts uh, around the UK to help provide advice to industry and facilitate the delivery of studies. And Alex, who's gonna be talking next, is the chair of the respiratory uh, TRC. And we also have Maya Buck in Manchester who heads up the musculoskeletal uh, equivalent. So all of these bits of infrastructure are all focused on those early phase trials and experimental medicine. Whereas the clinical research network more typically will be involved in later phase three and four trials. So the CRF is very much a partnership between uh, several trusts across Greater Manchester. It is led by Manchester University NHS Foundation Trust, but there are partnerships and therefore subcontracts to funding uh, to the Christie and also, as I'll, I'll show you shortly, more recently to the Northern Care Alliance to support activity over at Salford as well. So as I mentioned, we get a grant that we compete for every five years. 
uh, and was just recently re-awarded this year and then new funding started uh, in September and we've been awarded 15 and a half million over the next five years which is really nice because it's an uplift of three million and is allowing us to expand our footprint. We work very much on a cost recovery model, so we can't do studies for free. We expect studies to be funded either by an external grant or by commercial bodies. And therefore, the overall grant uh, that we get from NIHR uh, covers about 50 percent of our overall costs, with the remainder coming from commercial studies and academic studies that we are helping to deliver with our platform. So what sort of uh, services and facilities do we have? So uh, overall, we have both inpatient and outpatient facilities uh, across our various sites with more than 50 beds and chairs, more than 20 consultation rooms. We probably need to readdress those figures now because I think they'll be increasing. We have a dedicated children's facility at the Royal Manchester Children's Hospital. We have the dedicated oncology facility over at the Christie. And most importantly, we have staff who are really experienced in the delivery of early phase trials and doing them to the standards uh, required for regulatory bodies. This is also complemented by research pharmacy services and clinical trials, aseptic facilities, um, pre-analytical laboratory processing. And also we have access to various MR scanners, a PET MR at uh, Manchester Royal and the Periton Beam Research Facility uh, over at uh, the Christie. And then finally, we also have a focus on providing training opportunities for researchers and people interested in research at all levels. So be clear, our facilities are not just for highly experienced senior investigators. We are also there to support people newly getting into research and in fact can provide very good um, support for investigators doing early phase studies for the first time. So where are our facilities? Well, we started off with four and have gone up to six with the rebid. And one of the reasons for that is that we were very aware that our original four facilities were all set very much within central Manchester. And this greater Manchester map is coloured in by deprivation index. The lower the number, the more deprived you are. So while central Manchester might be pretty deprived with a, a number of six compared to Trafford or Stock or Stockport, you can see that we're not providing good access for people in the north of the region. And so opening up additional sites in Salford and in North Manchester, we're hoping is really going to help for access to patients from these regions and improve some of the inequalities in, in access to research that, that we're aware of. So this was our previous CRF, if people have interacted with us in the past, and the overall medical director, and until the end of last year, Helen Pidd was our operational manager and uh, managed the facility for over 20 years. Uh, and we have four facilities at Manchester Royal, the Children's, Withinshaw and the Christie. So what we've moved to with the new funding and the increase is to have six centres altogether. So at Manchester Royal, we have a very general adult unit that will take on um, research from all sorts of different specialties and that very much has facilities capable of delivering phase one studies as we have a ward area and we can house patients overnight as, as needed. And that's run by Ben Parker, who's a rheumatologist. We also have the Royal Manchester Children's uh, Clinical Research Facility housed in the Royal Manchester Children's Hospital uh, that has very, been very much um, designed by many of our patients. And if you get a chance, it's well worth going have a look at what a good job they've made of it. Uh, that's run by Simon Jones and has quite a focus on complex clinical trials of uh, therapies, particularly in rare diseases and particularly gene therapies. Then the first of our new sites is up at North Manchester General, where there are opportunities in infectious diseases, respiratory research, and also GMMH have, um, uh, have wards up there as well. And so that will give us access to expertise for some new specialties. And then, and that's run by Zoe Borrell, who's one of the respiratory physicians up there. And then at Salford, uh, we have Richard Warren heading up the facility there, which will be part of an existing clinical research facility that was previously focused more on later phase trials. 
And there they've got particular expertise in dermatology, Richard's dermatologist, and also the Jeffrey Jefferson um, neuroscience uh, unit are also very keen on getting some early phase trials up and running. Alex, who's going to speak next, Alex Horsley is a respiratory physician like myself, and he heads up the uh, CRF at Withenshaw, where, as you, do, you don't, might imagine, we have a, a lot of expertise and experience in respiratory trials uh, and also in trials of allergies. But that is not only what we do. We cover other studies as well and, and provide opportunities uh, across all the specialties uh, cited here. And then finally, um, Fiona Thistlethwaite, who's based at the Christie and heavily involved in the ECMC, as well as uh, the CRF, heads things up at uh, the Christie unit where they do a lot of early phase and particularly phase one oncology work. So the other thing about our new structure, as well as giving us more sites around Greater Manchester, more access for patients, um, particularly in the north of the, the city region, and bringing us uh, extra specialty expertise, it also maps better with the Biomedical Research Centre, as we now have um, sites uh, associated with all the main um, themes of the, of the revised BRC with the next generation therapeutics, diagnostics, and the health equity inclusivity really running across all of our sites and all specialties. To give you a bit of an idea of the scale of things that we do, this is just some of our highlights from our report last year. So this was over the four year period, we'd increase the number of studies that we were supporting by 57%. Uh, just under half of our studies fit into that early phase category of phase one and two A at 48%. Um, the folks over at the Christie and also uh, at uh, the children's unit have been doing an amazing job on advanced therapeutic trials with a big increase from doing very little, as you can see at the beginning of 2016-17, to large numbers of patients in these studies um, uh, uh, by by the end of uh, by, by the time we were rebidding at the end of 2021, and with Christie being the uh, one of the largest phase one cancer facilities in in Europe now. Also, we've been very successful at growing our industry work, um, growing it by um, by uh, about 80 percent altogether, and as you can see, almost a doubling in the number of our studies. That doesn't mean we don't have capacity to do more. And indeed, we remain very keen to support investigators wanting to do their, their first commercial trials. And then this just shows you some, uh, the sort of spread of the activity. This is actually a summary of the five years of the previous funding, because obviously we're only just starting the new rebid now. But as you can see, we've got a lot of phase one and phase two A work uh, going on with a definite growth in the phase two A. We don't do so much phase two B as that often doesn't require um, our facilities or expertise. But the phase three numbers are quite high simply because of the chemotherapy work and the children's work. Um, um, you can see in the purple and the mid blue colour here is all counted as uh, complex and there's a lot of that that needs doing. Uh, last couple of things to mention, as well as having a series of sites around uh, Greater Manchester, um, we are a very collaborative bunch in the clinical research facility. And so we're forming larger networks around the Northwest and increasingly planning to work with our colleagues who have CRFs up in Lancashire at the Royal Preston, uh, Liverpool, where they have a lot of expertise in um, clinical uh, pharmacology and R Richard Fitzgerald here runs the phase one unit there. And it, this alliance really came out of conversations with him and also Alder Hay, which is the has a children's unit there, too. And we think by doing something similar to what we've done across Jake Greater Manchester and getting our CRS together, we can help deliver studies together and also share our expertise. And this is going to have a particular focus on on delivering phase one trials with also in addition to coordinated um, delivery, thinking about sponsorship of those trials, skilling people up to do early phase trials and, of course, covering uh, looking at equality, diversity and inclusivity as well. Then last but not least, it is also worth being aware that Manchester is part of a large network of um, uh, clinical research facilities around the UK. 
Um, uh, just over 20 of them, are, I think it's 26 or 28 of them are funded by NIHR, but there are almost 60 now altogether, um, many of whom are not, don't have NIHR funding, but who are linked together by the UK CRF network. The network's traditionally been hosted in Manchester and was run by Helen Pidd, who I showed you a picture of previously. And uh, we have rebid for this funding, which has been increased substantially to help with the coordination of trials delivery around all these sites around the UK. So we've been able to do a collaborative bid between Manchester, Southampton, Cambridge and Lancashire for 2.4 million this time. And as I say, I would stress that the CRFs are a highly collaborative uh, group of facilities. Um, who work together extremely well during COVID and, and, and will continue to do so. So if people have grants uh, or studies that they're thinking of doing that require multiple sites, your CRF may well be able to help you with identifying through the network other sites that could find patients and, and participate in studies for you. So to summarise, hopefully it's clear we're a platform for delivery of early phase clinical trials and experimental medicine studies. We run on a cost recovery model, which allows us to grow our staff and our facilities. Uh, but we're part of a highly supportive network around Greater Manchester, around the Northwest region and around the UK as well. And so please don't hesitate to get in touch if you think you have a study that we might be able to help you with, or if you're just generally interested in early phase clinical trials. And I've just put up the contacts here for our operational managers, and one day I'll have pictures of them all as well. But it's Caroline Leach for Manchester Royal and the Royal Children's, Angela Kelsall for North Manchester and Withenshaw, Michelle Davies at the Christie, and Vicky O'Loughlin over at Salford. And with that, I will stop and pass you on to Alex next, I think. And then I think we're doing questions at the end, are we, Jane? Great. Thank you very much, uh, Jackie. So um, my name is Alex Horsley. I'm uh, an adult CF uh, clinician at Withenshaw and um, uh, director of the, the clinical research facility within Shaw as well. So I've been asked to talk about the specific example of CF and, and my experience over the last 10 years of how um, collectively with, with um, the help of my colleagues in the CRF and, and in the CF department, we've really transformed the delivery of research uh, within Shaw and, and, and contributed quite significantly, I think, to um, to, to some very groundbreaking medicines. So although this is called pathology of cure, CF is not cured, but, but certainly things have moved on very substantially in the last few years. Uh, there we go. Um, so uh, the, the research ecosystem at, at Woodenshaw, we've, we've, we've got this sort of um, pathway from phase one uh, through to phase three and then into clinical practice. And, and the CRF really sits very much in the center of that delivering uh, phase two research. But as you've You've heard from Jackie, we do phase one studies. We also, in certain populations, certain studies will do phase three studies as well. Um, we work very closely in CF with the Biomedical Research Center, and there's a lot of uh, what we call experimental medicine research that, that takes place, um, which the CRF also helps to deliver. We're very lucky at Withenshaw, and we have on site the Medicines Evaluation Unit. This is, uh, this is outside the NHS, but it's an early phase trials unit that does a lot of first in human work and has been. Um, uh, a real powerful offering when we've been uh, when companies have come to us because they can do first in human um, in the medicines evaluation unit and then move uh, straight into patients uh, through the CRF. And then we also obviously work with the CRA on those later phase studies too. So that just shows some of the infrastructure that, that we tap into. And uh, this is an overhead view of the hospital. If you've ever been to Withenshaw, it's an absolutely awful maze of a place because it's been built over many decades. But um, the key parts of it are that the CRF is on the main road as you come through. So we have our main facilities uh, here, uh, purpose-built centre, and then just opposite, across the road, uh, a newly opened CRF clinic. Uh, the Northwest Lung Centre is attached to that uh, with the bronchoscopy suite. And then the, the CF Centre, the uh, cystic fibrosis ward and the outpatients is attached to that. So um, we're very closely linked both to the respiratory clinics and also particularly uh, to the CF clinics. Other, other features of note, the other respiratory wards are not far away. We've got a cardio-respiratory MR scanner on site that opened uh, just last year, uh, and which we, we're also doing work with. Um, and then uh, the medicines evaluation unit, um, which I mentioned earlier, uh, importantly, is located 
um, just adjacent to our clinic and just opposite the CRF. So you can see within a very small footprint, we have um, a huge amount of research capability. And then our offices and labs are where I'm sitting at the moment are just a further away in the hospital. So I'll give you a bit of background on CF because you may not know about it. Um, it's an inherited condition and it's a, it's a common condition. It's, it's the most uh, common um, uh, faith inherited condition in the Caucasian population with a gene frequency of one in 25. So one in 25 people will have the gene, but will have no disease. You only get disease if you have both genes, uh, two copies of the gene. And it affects a, an iron channel, uh, an epithelial iron channel. So it has effects in many different organ systems, but it, it's predominantly the lungs that, that um, uh, that cause the sort of fatal problems. If we go back in time, if we go back to um, uh, when I was born, in fact, uh, the, um, the the median age of death was only seven years. And if you go back to the 60s, really, it was, it was very much a, a devastating disease, a quite rapid decline in, in infancy. Um, by the time we get to the noughties, the mid-noughties, that, that's improved and, and there was fantastic uh, advances over those uh, two or three decades there uh, to bring the, the median age of death up to 27 years. In the last 15 years, it, it's, it's more than doubled. Uh, and what, what happens in CF is you that the primary problem in the lungs is that the mucus becomes thick. So the, this failure of this iron channel means that the mucus can't be cleared from the lungs. And um, so it becomes stuck. You get blockage of the airways. Uh, it creates an environment which rather than trapping bugs, we all inhale bugs, rather than trapping bugs and, and bringing them out of the airways, actually it traps them and it gives them an environment in which they can grow. So the bacteria grow, they cause inflammation. Uh, the body responds to the, the infection by um, uh, putting lots of inflammatory cells in and some inflammatory proteases and, and it can lead to destruction of the airway wall. So you get a vicious cycle of infection and inflammation uh, that left untreated leads to progressive respiratory failure. And this is what would cause early death in our in our patients uh, and the interventions we we had until very recently we could offer um, physiotherapy and um, antibiotics and, and maybe anti-inflammatories but we were dealing very much with the consequences of disease and we had nothing to affect um, the actual cause of disease which was this problem with this iron channel not working so there are also some specific challenges of CF research. These are a complex uh, patient group. They have multiple comorbidities. And um, up here on the top right is a, is a typical um, daily um, medication load for a patient, in addition to which they would have nebulizers, physiotherapy, and you know, typical um, treatment regimens taking one to two hours per day just to remain stable. Because they have repeated IV antibiotics, they often have very difficult IV access. Their veins have become scarred and used up over time. So they may require ports, such as one uh, shown at the bottom there. And, and, and quite rightly, patients are very precious about these. They won't let just anyone play with them. Uh, so uh, difficult IV access and only certain nurses can access the ports. And what we also find is that patients who are unwell uh, tend to be quite interested in research, but actually they're, they're not really suitable for trials. They're, they're often excluded if they're too unwell. And the patients who are well enough for trials are also well enough to carry on with the normal activities of life and, and much less likely to have time for trials on top of the additional burden of their, their treatments. So the research nurses and patients were unfamiliar with each other. So the, the nurses didn't know about CF and the CF patients didn't know about research. Um, and uh, when we did a lot of these early phase studies, we would often find that they required inpatient stays uh, with these first in human drugs, first in CF patient drugs. You know, the, the sponsors require them to stay in to, to monitor for, for early side effects. And, and for patients who often have to come into hospital anyway, um, they're obviously keen to reduce their burden and not keen to stay in. So uh, what we did about this, well, we, we uh, had an education program for the nurses in the clinical research facility who um, were, were fantastic at taking this on board. Uh, we identified a, a CF research nurse lead, so a, a lead from within the, the CRF. Uh, we, we brought the CF trials physician to the CF clinics to learn about CF so that, that, that they would also know uh, a little, little bit more about the CF care. Um, we were lucky enough to get a CF research coordinator funded by the CF uh, Trust to help set studies up. We also have a fantastic uh, CF specialist research nurse, so a CF specialist nurse who sits in our CF clinic, um, but also is a research nurse, so is able to provide clinical care, but also then to recruit patients. Um, and she leads on the early visits and she's able to access ports. So we haven't got to um, train a, a, a variety of other paper, uh, nurses to, to access these ports. And, and we worked very closely with the MEU to deliver these phase one trials, uh, particularly ones that need inpatient stays. 
Um, it's not just trials we do. The other um, important aspect of our work is we run a lot of experimental medicine studies through the CRF. Uh, we have particular interests and strengths in, in lung physiology, and we're developing lung imaging as a biomarker, and, and, and that's the, uh, the scanner, the, the new cardiorespiratory MR scanner at the bottom there. And we also have a number of a large number of active studies looking at infection inflammation. So we're collecting um, airway samples for molecular analysis, for biomarker analysis. And just in the last um, six to 12 months, we've had a number of uh, really quite important papers published on, on the microbiome, on clinical trials, on uh, longitudinal uh, physiology and on uh, inflammatory markers in the lungs. Um, but that brings us to um, the CFTR modulators, a class of drugs which has really transformed CF care um, and uh, where the, the trials have been led um, and delivered in large part um, from, from Manchester. So uh, these drugs act directly on the CFTR molecule. What this image on the right shows, it's, it's the, the journey that, that um, uh, it undertaken in order to produce working CF molecules. CFTR is what it's called, CF molecule in the cell surface. So it starts off in DNA, it gets converted into RNA, then to protein, it has to travel up to the top uh, to be expressed. And, and in different mutations in the CF gene, things can go wrong at the transport stage or at the, uh, um, if it gets to the cell surface, it then doesn't work properly. And there are classes of drugs that have been developed over the last few years now that can open up a channel that's blocked, so it works on both of these sorts of problems, um, and another class of drugs that can help chaperone the drug through the cell to get to the cell surface, even if it doesn't fold quite properly. So by combining these drugs and combinations of these drugs, um, we can uh, cause quite um, impressive changes in the amount of functioning CF molecule at the cell surface. And since 2012, uh, in Manchester, we've taken part in over 30 trials of different combinations from different companies and, and you know, using two, one, two, or even three combinations. Um, and, and we've run those in the phase one at MEU through to phase two at CRF and then into open label trials. And we managed to keep these going during the pandemic as well with the help of the CRF and the help of the CRF research team. Um, and the triple therapy, the, the outcome of all this is that there is a triple therapy that's now in clinical practice called CAFTRIO, and that's absolutely transformed CF care. Uh, what we don't have at the moment is anything to treat patients who have a, a problem at this very, very early step, the, 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 the creation of, uh, of, a, of a readable RNA. So if you have a mutation in the, in the gene which stops this from reading, you never get anything that you can, you can work these molecules on, and I'll come back to that at the end. So we've had some important trial outputs co-authored by Manchester investigators on the back of this. So this is a phase two triple therapy study was published in the New England Journal in 2018, the phase three study in 2021, and we, accessed, we had access to the drugs uh, from uh, 2020. And this has had a, a massive impact on patient health. So um, it, because it works on the, uh, on the CF molecule itself, uh, patients find that they're able to start moving the mucus in their lungs. It doesn't get stuck. So we see, we see a very impressive increase in lung function. But because they're much better, we also see an improvement in their weight as well. And in fact, we now have the opposite problem where our patients are, um, have a tendency to get overweight and we're having to, to, to wean them off the, the, the high, high fat, high calorie diet that, that we used to have to encourage them to take. And we've seen a huge reduction in our inpatient bed demand as, as a result of that. Uh, we've seen a reduction in need for rescue treatments. Uh, we've seen um, an increase in pregnancies, really quite an impressive increase in pregnancies, and uh, a number of those not planned. Um, and uh, his people who were, were pleased, but that, that's not always the case. Uh, we've had no transplants for those on CAFTRO, and, and eight patients have now come off the list. Um, and uh, we, we've had a massive reduction in the number of patients who, um, you know, who haven't survived because of their CF. So looking to the future, we, there is an ongoing search for better drugs. Uh, so although we have fantastic uh, drug in CAFTRO, it's not the end of the, the journey for CFTR modulators. Uh, BX121 is a next generation triple therapy. We did the phase one at MEU in 2018, the phase two in the CRF in 2019. We finished that just before the pandemic hit. Um, there was a slight delay before the phase three started last year. And, and then we, we look to finish that early next year. Um, and uh, the hope is that this will um, have greater effect, at least, or at least as good effect as the current um, modulators, but, but will only be a once a day treatment. Um, we also, though, need treatments for those who don't respond to modulator therapies. And we're looking here particularly at inhaled therapies and particularly gene based therapies. So inhaling genetic information that can lead to um, uh, new um, 
gene in the cells that, that, that can then be read to produce the protein rather than trying to uh, do anything with the, with the gene that's faulty. Um, and we're working with, a, with at least two big pharma studies, which we think will probably open next year. And um, we have a team looking at how to overcome those regulatory hurdles. Um, we need uh, challenge chambers. So we're, again, we're working with the MEU on that. Um, and we will need prolonged inpatient stay after the first dosing to look at how we adapt the CRF in order to deliver that. Um, and you know, the CRF and, and, and the CF team have really had quite a big impact on, on these clinical trials overall. Um, we, uh, we've had global firsts for this triple therapy and for um, an antifungal treatment uh, with the highest recruiter to adult CF studies in the UK. And one of the highest recruiters in the EU, it's a bit harder to work out in the EU whether we're the highest recruiter, but I think we're, we're certainly one of the highest. And um, we have three PIs who are very active in research in, in, uh, in the Adult CF Centre, uh, but we're also very well supported by um, the, the CF Trust who provide funding for a trials coordinator through the Clinical Trials Accelerator platform. Um, and we're now one of six early phase centres in the UK. So we're leading on the um, up inhaled mRNA genetic therapy study. Um, uh, and as I said, you know, when these drugs come through, there are six centres in the UK that have been uh, set up to be early phase centres for CF trials. And we're the only one really between London and Edinburgh. Um, and we have led, importantly, it's not just about trials, we've, we've really led the way in, in the, the clinical rollout of these life-changing therapies that have made a, a, an absolutely massive difference to our patients. Uh, so uh, that's all I had to say, but um, I would encourage you if, if you are um, you know, interested in doing trials uh, in Willenshaw, then come speak to myself, Angela Kelsall, very happy to show you around the unit and to talk to you about how we can support you. So I will stop there and hand over to Fiona. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Uh, so I will just attempt to screen share. So um, hopefully you can see that. Um, oh, not yet. Hopefully you can see it now. Um, so my name's Fiona Thistlethwaite. I, I, as uh, Jackie's mentioned already, I work at the Christie. I'm the uh, medical director of the CRF and also work within the early phase trials team. So what I wanted to do today was just give you a feel for some of the work that we're doing um, at the Christie uh, on the CRF and give you a bit of a flavour for some of the, the challenges we face with some of the actually really exciting new drugs that are coming through, uh, but that are not always straightforward to deliver. Um, so if I just hopefully it will go on to the next slide. There we go. So um, I'm just going to move my screen across like this so that I can see it fully. Um, so at the Christie we have um, a large CRF, really well, uh, really good facilities. Um, so we have 10 inpatient beds on the CRF purely for clinical trials patients and 26 treatment chairs. Um, in our outpatients area, so that's all on our treatment floor, but on the ground floor we have outpatients where we have 16 consultation rooms that are shared by 16 rooms where the doctor can and nurses can um can kind of prepare for to see the patient and then they'll go into the consultation rooms to see them and um, the crf at the christie is open 24 hours a day monday to thursday at the moment uh, and then just nine to five on on friday we're not open at the weekends routinely but we actually do have staff now uh, the establishment, we've increased the establishment sufficient that we are actually looking to get uh, open um, at least Friday nights initially and then weekends as required. Um, we have five principal investigators within the Experiment Cancer Medicine team who um, deliver first in human studies and some of the more complex early phase trials. Uh, but we also have over 30 um, uh, principal investigators and chief investigators within the disease specific uh, research teams. Uh, we have two training advanced nurse practitioners and on our CRF we have um, around 20 CRF based research nurses and I think there's more like uh, around 80 research nurses based within the disease teams but actually on the CRF we have 20 uh, research nurses and 19 other support staff, such as our healthcare professionals and then our, our quality team and our data team. And um, we also have a dedicated pre-analytic laboratory with five technicians processing over 1600 samples per month, so really high throughput. 
Um, this slide uh, needs a little bit of explanation. It's slightly complicated, but I think it's worth just pausing and looking at for a moment. So this shows our activity on the Christie CRF from April 2019 through to, to around August, September time of this year. Um, and as everyone knows, two, well, something happened early in 2020, um, which you, you, you will be fully aware of, I'm sure, of the uh, COVID hitting. But actually, these statistics also uh, the, the, uh, underlying these, uh, this information, there's a second thing happened around the same time. And that was previously, um, we had been reporting in, in terms of our activity figures, we hadn't been taking out any patients who were cancelled. So um, within with cancer patients, obviously, um, many patients come for their treatment and actually aren't well enough to go ahead with the treatment or their blood tests aren't right or there's some kind of delay. So between 20 and 30 percent of patients actually who are booked onto the CRF don't actually receive treatment. And, and prior to, to around February 2020, we had actually we'd not been cancelling those patients in our stats. So that was a, a 20 percent drop off. We'd also been counting patients who were just coming for haematology samples rather than actually receiving drug. So um, uh, although the, there is a very real drop due to COVID, we also, these earlier figures actually um, uh, are hiding around a 40% overestimation of the number of patients we were seeing. However, there was very much a, a drop. And this is the number of patients coming through our CRF on a month by month basis um, to receive trials broken down by the different trials there. So, Around the start of COVID, we were around uh, somewhere between 100 and 200 patients. And I hope you can see that gradually since then, we've been picking back up and increasing the number of patients. And actually, the reality is it's back to somewhere around what we were actually treating on the CRF prior to COVID hitting. But there's a few other things that are quite interesting to see here. So hopefully you can see that uh, the majority of our work in the Christie's early phase trials, so phase one or two A trials. Um, we do have some of those more complex phase three trials coming through, as Jackie mentioned earlier. And I think also what we feel we're seeing is a, a kind of range of other trials that are gradually increasing on the CRF, things like uh, device trials, some of our um, um, uh, drug drug interaction trials or diet interaction trials as well. Um, so I, I think what we've seen since COVID, we've recovered, we've got back to where we were, but actually the CRF feels much, much busier than it ever did. And I think that's one of the things that I really want to just touch on why that is um, in today's talk and give you a kind of flavour for some of the drugs that are coming through our CRF now and why the, the activity, things feel much busier, perhaps um, over and above those, those numbers that actually look like we've kind of got back to where we were, plus maybe a little bit more. Um, so I think um, we've, we've heard already about that kind of trials landscape uh, that historically we saw research and discovery, preclinical development of drugs, and then going through the phase one, phase two, phase three, and into the post-approval at phase four. Um, with phase one being what's the safe dose, what's the uh, uh, side effects, at least in the short term. Phase two, a kind of separate trial looking more at does this drug work? Phase three, thinking about is it better than existing treatments and then into that kind of post approval phase, of what are the longer term side effects and rarer um, side effects. I think certainly within the oncology setting, and I think probably across all of the CRS, what we're seeing is a change in that landscape, moving away from doing a phase one trial and then stopping and doing, going into phase two. And um, instead of that, actually they're merging into the almost the majority of our trials now are phase one, two, or phase 1A, 1B, or phase 1B, 2 trials. So we're getting that merging across all of the, the different phases of trials. And this is seen particularly in some of our more complex trials. And I'm going to just kind of highlight one group of drugs that we've seen a huge increase coming through the CRF at the Christie, and that's with T-cell engagers. Uh, and I'll just pause a little bit and explain what those are. So we've, we've used antibody treatments for quite some time in oncology now, where there's an antibody that can detect um, a, a, a protein on a tumour cell and hopefully in some different mechanisms de destroy that tumour cell in some way. 
And um, we've also seen trials looking at, at uh, anti T cell antibodies, trying to activate the T cells. The danger with this is that actually what you can get is very non-specific activation of T cells, which can be actually dangerous, even life threatening in itself. Um, and also with the uh, kind of historical antibodies that we've used, you see increasing um, drug resistance or, or destruction of, of the antibodies so that you need repeated treatments and that uh, eventually patients develop resistance. So a new class of uh, drugs includes these bispecific T cell engager antibodies. They're not always antibodies, actually, sometimes they're T cell receptors, but essentially what these new drugs do is, is link that idea that you can connect to the T cells and activate them uh, and get, connect it to the actual tumour antigens uh, in the, the tumour microenvironment, so within the cancer metastases themselves. And so these link together and cause the T cells to be activated and release cytokines um, that can then have an anti-cancer effect um, or the T cell can have a direct anti-cancer effect uh, where it's most needed. So within the tumour microenvironment. Um, but despite being much more focused on the T cells, these drugs still come with really significant challenges. So toxicity side effects, first of all. And, and this slide just demonstrates some of the many, many side effects that you can get. Actually, this is this is demonstrating something called cytokine release syndrome, where the cytokines occur, um, spread out throughout the patient's body and can give side effects in multiple different organs. With our T cell engager molecules, this is, I guess, more common or more severe with some of the cell therapies that we use. But with T cell engagers, what we still see is some of these issues around uh, fevers, rigor, so shivers and shakes, flu-like symptoms that patients experience, uh, particularly when they're first given the drug. And an example of this is a trial that we've been running on the CRF. Uh, the Christie for some time now and it, 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 its uh, first initial results were presented this year in, in Paris at the ESMO Congress, so uh, European Society of Medical Oncology, which is the biggest European Congress um, in, in oncology. And essentially, this is a T cell engager connecting an antigen on the cancer cells called PRAIM uh, with T cells through a, a, a T cell engager molecule. So this is the PRAIM study. And I think it's quite interesting just to look at a few aspects of that uh, to kind of highlight some of the challenges that we see. So this slide just shows the kind of study design. So on, on the surface of it, it seems relatively simple. So it's a treatment, uh, the patients have an infusion and their uh, disease is assessed every nine weeks. And that's fairly standard for our oncology trials. Um, but this slide also flags some of the challenges. So First of all, there's two eligibility criteria that we need to not just identify patients that fall into the right cancer groups, but we need to pre-screen those patients to identify which patients have a chance of responding. And two aspects of that is looking at the patient's HLA, their tissue type, and that their cancer expresses that antigen on the surface, the protein on the surface of the cancer cells prey. And so the reality is to identify one patient who might be suitable for this trial, we probably have to pre-screen at least five patients to identify one who's suitable. And even when we identify that one patient who's double positive, there may be other reasons why they're not suitable for the trial. So it brings up front rapid and the need for rapid pre-screening for these patients to be able to get them onto trial in a, in a kind of timely fashion. We also need to be able to give these patients weekly infusions um, and that's actually very intensive for, for quite a few years, for 10 years or so we've been in oncology, there's been a flourishing um, targeted agents, many of which are actually tablet treatments. So this has been a complete shift back to not just intravenous treatments but um, weekly treatments which is very intensive on our beds. But also these treatments are, um, because they're quite big molecules, the IMTEX, relative to a kind of targeted agent, they have quite short half-lives. So the drugs need to be made up on site in our aseptics unit. And there's some challenges around the short half-life, meaning that they can't be made a week or days in advance. They have to be made on the day or at least the day before. 
And then the added complication is the trials themselves are actually quite complicated to run because because of those side effects with the cytokine release syndrome that I mentioned or cytokine storm. And um, we tend to start each patient on a low dose. We get the worst effects early on during the treatment. Uh, so in the first few cycles and each patient, we do an intrapatient dose escalation. So they start on the low dose, go to an intermediate dose the next week and then up to a higher dose. And um, so it makes it quite complicated for the teams running the trials, we've got lots of different patients on lots of different doses at, at any one time. In terms of results, the early results that were published to ESMO, uh, what they showed and what I've been kind of hinting at is that the, the biggest toxicity, the main side effect for these drugs is cytokine release syndrome. And around half of patients, at least half of patients had cytokine release syndrome. Again, it tended to be during the first few doses. So the majority of CRS occurred in the first three doses of a drug. And what that means is that for these patients who are starting these drugs, we need to keep them as inpatients for one or two days for the first few doses so that we can manage their side effect. They tend to be grade one or two. So patients are getting kind of flu-like symptoms, but not needing that really kind of intensive care or kind of um, powerful anti-inflammatory drugs like tocilizumab that we need to use for some of our cell therapy patients. We can manage most patients with paracetamol and with steroids, but they really need to be an inpatient and staying overnight for several doses before they can be treated more like in the outpatient setting. But, uh, and this is what's really exciting about these drugs, we're seeing some really interesting and fascinating results. So with Prame, um, this is something called a spider plot. These are the kind of initial results that were published at ESMO. And spider plots, if, you, if you're not familiar with seeing them, each line represents one patient. And I've never seen a spider plot quite like this one. And that's because in oncology trials, what we tend to see is some patients responding, a few patients responding, but the majority of patients don't respond. And so what you see is the, the lines trending upwards over time. Um, because on the y-axis, what we've got here is essentially growth of the cancer, starting at zero, which is where the patient, when the patient starts the trial, and then the y-axis is the percentage increase or decrease of that patient's cancer over time. And the majority of times we see uh, spider plots where the trend is upwards over time. In this case, what we see is actually this remarkable stabilization of patients' disease over a long period of time, 12 months and actually beyond. And that's actually seen in the majority of patients. And while some patients actually the disease shrinks, there's still a good proportion of patients where the disease can actually get a bit worse initially before we see this stabilization, that pattern of stabilization. And that's great news for patients. This is going to be a really effective drug, I'm sure, that will come through later phase trials. But what it means for us on the CRF is patients are staying on trial longer, they're needing these weekly treatments, even if they're not having to stay overnight once they've been established on the drug, we're, we're having to, it's a degree of intensity that we haven't seen before. Um, and what's that, what that's meant is we've moved away from this idea where we stay overnight just to do blood sampling to check the level of a uh, patient's, uh, the drug in the patient's blood, that actually we're having to actively manage patients on our CRF unit, uh, manage things like lines, and alongside that, develop our staff training in terms of, um, of both um, a, a, a training kind of on protocols, but also on how to manage the toxicities and doing things like scenario training, uh, managing emergencies that can happen with these patients overnight. And so the other thing that I wanted to comment on just in the last couple of minutes is this idea that patients are staying on longer and that our trials are becoming more complicated. So gone are the days when we do a kind of a, a, a monotherapy, so a single drug escalation that would go into a bit of expansion and then that would be the end of our phase one trial. What we're seeing now is uh, people wanting to rapidly get through to that expansion phase. So using kind of single patient escalations, for example, or smaller numbers of patients in their escalation by having adaptive trial design. And while we're still escalating, perhaps going back one step to then do things like biomarker dense and looking at um, biopsy, uh, serial biopsies for patients that perhaps a lower dose has been shown so that that's been already been shown to be safe while we're continuing the escalation. So again, it's that idea that we've got multiple patients receiving multiple different doses, some having biopsies, some not having biopsies. 
And then for Prime, uh, as an example, what we've seen as well is doing the monotherapy escalation alongside combination escalation. So staggered. So the, the first cohort starts later, but combining with things like other drugs, uh, immune uh, immunotherapies that are already approved drugs, doing that combination straight away, not waiting to get to your uh, recommended phase two dose, you start the escalation. And then actually spreading straight into the phase two. So doing a phase one, phase two trial where we might have biomarker selected or non-selected patients. We might have patients who've already received immunotherapy in the past or not. And then we might have specific indications for different types of cancer, for example. And some of this is planned at the beginning of the trial, but I have to say some of it is done as amendments. We've seen a huge increase in the number of amendments that come through our trials uh, as they're uh, running through um, to add extra cohorts or look at biomarker selection, for example. And all of this, I think, is adding to that idea that we're busier than we've ever been on our on our CRF. And hopefully I've given you a kind of flavour for that as I've talked about these specific examples. What that's meant is we've had to increase our staffing on the unit. And actually some of the trials like Prey, many of our trials are commercial trials. And so we've been in a really fortunate position that we can say as we've increased in busyness, we can increase our establishment and do that model that Jackie talked about. If we're bringing in income, we can um, add extra staff as, as has been needed. So we've got a really good number of staff now on our CRF with actually for once very few vacancies. So I know that's something that we, there's always a turnover of staff that's to be expected. But by building up our staffing levels, we can match the activity to the number of staff that we have on the CRF. And that's been really nice to see because if we stretch staff too much, then, then it makes it not a, a great place to work. It's not a nice environment to work. And what that's meant is that we're treating more patients and we're able to give them what we hope is really top care. And here's just I'm just going to finish with this last slide, a few quotes from some of our, our patients in our recent um, patient survey. Uh, that's hopefully demonstrating that only are we busy bringing new treatments to patients, keeping patients on trials for longer, um, but also actually keeping the patient at the heart of everything that we do. Um, so I'm going to stop there. Uh, I think uh, there's a few minutes just to hand back to Jackie, if that's OK. But uh, Jackie, shall I, uh, shall, I, shall I leave that slide up or do you want me to take it down? <laughs> I think it's a nice one. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll leave it there. It there. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we're getting one or two questions through and we've got about we've got two or three minutes just to squeeze a few in. So from Jonathan, I've got post COVID, are we seeing more engaged or less engaged communities? How do we reach the underserved as treatments become more complex, more precise? Can we still deliver to these communities? Um, I can probably have a bit of a stab at that one, but Alex and Fiona, feel free to chip in. So, so as I mentioned in my talk, we're doing our best to, to open up research sites closer to our various communities in, in Greater Manchester, but I think distance is far from the only barrier to people partake, taking part in, in clinical trials and particularly in early phase trials. And, and it's some of the work that, that we're going to be doing more of in the context of the CRF and the BRC in subsequent years to try and understand how we can encourage those less engaged communities to get involved in research and what the barriers might be and what sort of things might um, might encourage them to to get involved um, in terms of how complex and precise the the studies are so there are many studies that require our clinical research facilities people to come in but but we do we have a van these days as well that we share with the crn and the brc which is out and about in various bits of Manchester as we speak and so the other aspect of this that we can think about is is whether to that making our research more mobile is going to be part of the answer in the future. Alex, Fiona, anything to add to that from your perspectives? I, I would I would echo that I think we, we see this we see this in Jeff, we see in other diseases as well that and um, that distance is a huge barrier to patients and particularly with underserved population, bringing research to them is going to be really important um, and being visible uh, you know, in their communities, essentially. So the expansion of the CRF and as you as you correctly referenced, the van will make a big difference to that. But I, th I think that, you know, COVID was a, was a big success story for research, so it, it has helped. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And I think, I mean, you've, you've seen from both what Alex and myself have said is this, there's certain trials that we just have to run at our main site where it's a safe place to treat patients. But but that visibility within communities of explaining what it is that we're doing and why we're doing it. And just things like um, reassuring patients that are, you know who take part in commercial trials, their transport is always refunded and we can help organise taxis or to that transport issue. So there's some simple things that I think often um, communities don't, don't really realise. And it's our job to make sure that that everyone understands those things, that that uh, research is open to all patients and that we can help with some of the, those concerns for patients. That's great. Thanks so much, all. Um, just on a practical level, um, if anyone wanted to get involved or kind of um, look to you guys to do research trials, etc., who would they go to? Would it be the um, ops leads per site? I'm happy to share that with the um, attendees today as well. Yeah, or any of us, I would say, Jane, yeah. as well. What, whatever people prefer, the op leads email addresses I, I put up there, but any of the directors are happy, will be happy to be contacted um, as well. So, yeah, we're, we're not fussy. <laughs> Get in touch with your local CRF. If the CRF at your site maybe doesn't have the expertise or the patients or things, you know, we will pass you across other sites and to other people. We worked very much as a as a coordinated team in that way. So yeah, whoever's easiest for you to get in touch with will be a good place to start. That's great. Does anyone have any other questions or any speakers want to say anything else before we close? No? That's great. Just to say a big thank you for everyone for joining. It's been great, a great session. Lots of you here, really, really great talks and really useful. So yeah, thank you so, so much. And yeah, we'll send contact details and this video link after the event as well. Have a nice evening. Take care. Bye. Bye.